The Magician's Niece presents Sinisterhood by Helena Marie Chandler. Music by Adrian Romero. Chapter 57 The Owl. Lowton School for Children with Learning Difficulties. Wimbledon, SW19. Friday, the 11th of October, 1985. Dear Victoria, it is with great regret that I write to you of Dawn's ill behaviour this week. It seems, particularly since our meeting on Monday, that Dawn has been feeling very angry and upset. I put this down to two factors. First, her disappointment at learning that the house will no longer be hers. Second, her final realisation that Miss Dunleavy will never return. I'm afraid to say that Dawn has told me she will not cooperate with any logistics or communications on your part. I understand how hurtful this might seem to you, but you must know that this kind of erratic behaviour is only commonplace in bereaved children of her condition. Dawn has told me that she does not want to return to Northern Ireland at half term. She has also stated that she would prefer to spend her birthday with Etta and Mrs Wade in her Wimbledon house. I have vehemently urged Dawn to reconsider her decision, for her own good, and to avoid any more pain and disappointment. I have told Mrs Wade that Dawn is not to be taken to your house in Wimbledon again, at least not without your written permission. Dawn will, of course, spend her half-term holiday and her birthday with you in Northern Ireland. Might I suggest, as previously discussed on the telephone, that you continue doing your best to bring Dawn round to sense. Dawn and I have discussed in a previous session the idea of a dog. I know this is something you suggested. A companion for Dawn, as well as a focus for all of her emotions, will be, I think, a means for her to be drawn back to you at home in Northern Ireland. With all best wishes, Dr. Sophia Jones, MD, MA, FRC Psych. Chapter 58 The Vulture Victoria had to pinch her nose. The smells that engulfed her as she entered the Hollywood pet shop made her feel quite sick. All that noise and all that sawdust, all that fish food, those animal droppings. It was a shop of horrors, a shop of squeaking and squawking and barking. No wonder she'd chosen only silent, furless and aloof cats to be her companions. Cats were simple, cats were elegant, none of this baseness and mess. Some people loved animals, but Victoria wasn't one of them. She wasn't one of those delirious people who fawned over other people's pets. When a so-called friendly dog approached her on her walks in the woods, Victoria would stride quickly in the opposite direction. She was particularly averse to rabbits and gerbils and hamsters. She couldn't see the point in those ratty little animals at all. Apparently Dawn had a guinea pig at school. As repulsed as Victoria was at this thought, she took it as evidence that the sacrifice of having a sprog of a dog potentially poo all over her Axminster carpet was, disappointingly, entirely worth it. The venerable Sophia Jones, Victoria's duped accomplice, her medical marionette, had suggested Victoria purchase a dog as a means for Dawn to grow closer to her mother. You can dialogue with your daughter through the pet, about the pet, and with the pet. They are marvellous conduits for communication. Barking mad, Victoria had thought, before remembering that it was all for a good cause. The project, her livelihood, the house. Dr. Jones had said that Dawn's preferred choice of breed was a Labrador puppy, because they always looked like they were smiling. How sweet, Victoria had had to robotically chirp during their most recent telephone conversation. My lovely Dawn, anything to please her, anything to make sure she knows that she's loved. Victoria had to confess that she couldn't really tell the many breeds of dog apart but she did know what a Labrador was because she owned a television and had seen that saccharine loo roll advert far too many times. 
When she found that knot of sandy-coloured bodies, therefore, in the far corner of the pet shop, she knew she'd found the Labradors. They were all piled together in a mass, intertwined and ever wriggling, as if recently tumbled from a painting by M. C. Escher. A furry cluster of paws and claws that folded in on itself. Victoria bent forward and tried to pull one out. Excuse me, came the voice of the shop girl over the cacophony of barks and cries. Can I help? You can't just take one. Victoria huffed a little as she straightened. Did this Twitter the girl really think that she, dressed in her Burberry trench coat and Gucci shoes, was going to steal a puppy? I need to buy one of these. It's a birthday present for my daughter. Lucky girl, said the shop girl. How old is your little one? She's not a little one, actually. She's eighteen. Victoria considered adding the supplementary detail that the young girl suffered from a severe disability, hoping that she might be offered a considerable discount on the dog. But she thought better of it. It was none of this girl's business, and, in any case, she couldn't imagine that these four-pound bundles of fur and flesh could possibly be that expensive. It's a lovely gift. Would she prefer a boy or a girl? Victoria thought for a moment. Of course she wanted the easiest one to manage. In her experience, men were more docile, but many had insatiable and predatory appetites. She didn't want her cats to be the victims of any unsavoury attacks. The female of the species, however, was much more highly strung. They got nervous and upset. She didn't want to be sitting around comforting a moaning bitch all day. That was the last of her intentions. Can the boy dog be, um, done? asked Victoria tremulously. Yes, they're still young enough. A boy, therefore, it would be. Victoria took her checkbook from her purse. Go on then, how much? That'll be £275, please. Victoria nearly choked. She nearly fell off her new Gucci's. That's the price of a mini-break in Malaga, she thought. A long weekend in Paris. My God, this had better work. The dog was handed over in a little plastic cage. It pressed its pathetic little mutt against the bars and gave a whimper. Victoria knew that tactic. Poor little me, give me a pat. She'd done it herself so many times before. But that dog would be getting as few pats as possible. No use getting it used to what it definitely wasn't going to, long term, receive. Do you need a dog basket? asked the shop girl before Victoria had managed to leave. No, thank you. I'm sure I can find something suitable at home. This place may have been peddling cuteness, but Victoria most certainly was no mug. No, the little beggar would be fed and watered, but it would be kept in its plastic cage in the shed. But, later that afternoon, before stowing the puppy in its assigned place of lodging, Victoria took a Polaroid snap of the thing, sitting it softly on the sofa. My God, even she had to admit that this bundle of muscular fluff was quite sweet. If this didn't earn her a gazillion of Dawn's meagerly dispensed brownie points, Victoria didn't know what possibly could. Chapter 59 The Dove Sunday the 23rd of January, 1973 I really am a horrible person. Maybe that's why unconsciously I long ago decided to dedicate myself to children in need, a kind of penance. Maybe my relationship with Nigel has been a sort of God-sent punishment. Maybe I knew that he was gay all along. Maybe I've engineered the whole sorry thing as a form of self-harm for what I've always known, just never consciously. Perhaps my agreement to take on Dawn as her guardian, and at such short notice, was a means to relieve my latent feelings of guilt. It all became clear to me when I was watching a documentary last night. I don't know why I was watching it. I haven't the least interest in the natural world. Fate? Perhaps? I don't really believe in fate. I don't know if I believe in anything. Not anymore. Perhaps it was just a coincidence. Perhaps I've unconsciously been on the lookout for some kind of answer, anywhere it can be possibly found. The show was about rabbits, living in a warren. It was about families, 
about parent rabbits and how they spend all their time caring for their young. But I don't remember caring for those poisoned rabbits during those few years that I had them at all. I was a lazy child, and my parents never noticed because I always did well enough at school. They clearly never noticed how mean I was to Victoria. Daddy was always working, and Mummy wanted the easy life at the golf club with all of her friends. When I come to think of it, my mother was seldom in the house. I have memories of her constantly jetting off on her bicycle, leaving me to make sandwiches for Daddy's tea. I don't know why he didn't complain. Yes, she was the president of the golf club, a well-respected lady in the community. But wasn't it her duty, as mother and housewife, to nurture us and guide us and provide her husband with a hot meal when he came home? I begged for those rabbits, because everyone was getting pets at school. But I should never have been trusted with them, because I was always selfish, and I couldn't be bothered to look after them and I only got them out of their cage to show them off to all of my friends. My behaviour was so appalling that I'm sure I've kept any image of it stowed away in the dankest depths of my memory, because even I am too embarrassed to admit it, even to myself. All of the images I'm reliving now show me to be absolutely despicable. I don't doubt that I shouldn't be given the opportunity to have any children of my own. I'm too lazy and selfish to care for anybody anybody other than myself. There was a sequence in the documentary about a baby rabbit that had died. Of course, they engineer these documentaries for maximum emotional punch. I'm sure they're edited to manipulate the viewer's feelings. And with that soundtrack of tear-jerking string music and the weary voiceover of some so-called expert, I found myself crying at what I saw. I found myself crying because those images, those sounds, They brought back terrible memories. Martha and Mary lying dead in their hutch when my friend Josephine came round to play with them. Their eyes were wide open, like shining marbles, and I knew straight away that they'd died because of me. I'd neglected them. I can't remember ever regularly feeding those animals, let alone keeping their water fresh. I was so ashamed at my laziness that I blamed poor little Victoria. I can't remember which event happened first, the pearls or the rabbits, but my parents must have been sufficiently disgusted by their own daughter already, because they fell for my story utterly. They were duped. I told them that I'd seen Victoria putting a strange herb into their cage and pouring away their water. The parents never checked on my pets. They were kept in a cage at the bottom of the garden. They had no evidence that the story wasn't true. The beatings that ensued were endless. I remember having to leave the house, to go for a walk on the beach. Victoria wasn't allowed to see her friends. She wasn't allowed to go to the golf club. The school was informed, the grandparents were told, and a special meeting was arranged at the church. I might be inventing these memories. They're still so vague and unclear. But having recalled what I did to Victoria when I carelessly lost those pearls, I just can't doubt that these new memories are true. Oh God, I was such a wicked child. I wonder how many children we think are angelic and good are really just talented little actors. I don't doubt that Victoria lived up to all these monikers that she was given. Naughty, wicked, despicable, cheating, liar, ugly, unkind. And she lived up to them all with my helping hand. I bet it was me who told Victoria to cheat in that village fate cake contest. I was already 18 by then and I don't doubt that it was within me to suggest to Victoria that everyone was at it, that no one bothered to make their own cakes. She could have protested her own innocence, perhaps she did, but by then the lines between goodness and badness were already thoroughly blurred. Perhaps it was me who pushed Victoria into stealing my Jeffrey. Perhaps I always just used Victoria as an instrument to injure myself. She must really, really hate me. I've no choice now but to ask for her forgiveness. Chapter 60 The 
magic. Etta had been reading Kira's diary with Dawn. She had done much more reading than Dawn in her life, and she was twice the age of her friend. She could, therefore, explain some of the bits that Dawn didn't understand. Etta didn't understand all of it, she had to admit, but she got a very strong impression of Kira from all the words that she saw. Kira had done lots of nasty things when she was growing up. Etta could see that a lot of the nasty things had made Victoria very mad. There was a bit in the book about Victoria stealing a man called Geoffrey, who Etta thought must have been Dawn's daddy. Lots of people steal things. Some people steal money. Some people steal clothes. But Etta didn't know of anybody who had stolen another person. Etta could tell that Dawn was getting her suspicions going again. She kept saying things like, This shows that Mummy was angry with Kira, and that's why she pushed her into the sea. Etta had to admit that accusing a person of murdering two animals would be enough to drive them crazy. But this all happened so many years ago. Etta kept telling Dawn, just like she always had, that you had to forgive and forget in life because otherwise you never break the chain. An endless ring of angry people, always taking revenge. Etta thought that families were a lot like chains. Each family was like a ring of people, and then the children of one mummy and daddy became the mummy and daddy of more children, and then one ring was added to another, and that's how you got the chain. The chain was given a special name. That's your name that comes after your first name. The chain that was called Doville, her chain, was one that was an endless ring of angry people always taking revenge. Dawn kept saying, I don't care. I'm going to phone my mummy. I'm going to tell her that we all know what she did. But Etta kept correcting her. Dawn didn't know. Dawn didn't have any proof. She just had some fuzzy feelings and ideas. Etta didn't see much of her family, but it was all right because nobody would hurt her here in Lotan's. Nobody could get angry with her here, and Etta didn't have the chance to get angry back at them. This was all, thought Etta, a very good thing because the only way that all the violence and the horrible things could be finished with was the ability to say sorry and then for the other person to forgive and forget. Friday, the 22nd of June, 1974. I've had enough of this. It's been 18 months since I first tried to apologise to Victoria. I've tried and tried to communicate with my sister. I did terrible things, and I know she knows I did terrible things. But so many years have passed, and she managed to do plenty of terrible things to me. I thought that the arrival of Dawn in my life might be a way for us to get to know each other better. We hardly know each other at all. Those vague and horrible memories are the only real knowledge we have of each other. But Victoria has contributed these past couple of years not one bit to Dawn's life. No phone calls, no letters. She's just left it all to me. Not that I mind. Dawn's the child I haven't been able to have so far. I finally got rid of Nigel, so there may still yet be another opportunity for that. I don't hold it against him because it's not too late and he's let me keep the house. But if I've learned anything with Dawn, it's that I desperately want my own child too. My latest attempt at apologising for everything I did wrong to Victoria was met with a blunt response. I phoned her several times, leaving many messages on her answer phone. She eventually deigned to respond, 
waiting until I was most definitely out at work to leave her sharp-tongued message, not giving me any opportunity to talk things through, to give my fullest apology. All I got from my sister was, it's too late, I've moved on, and it's a future without you. Apparently it's to be a future without her dawn as well. I suppose I'm the baddie in this situation, that Victoria has every right to move on and to simply forget me. But I just can't bear this guilt, and she's fully aware of the pain it causes me. I can tell she's enjoying this power trip. She won't let me move on with my life. I'm going to have to try my hardest not to go through the rest of my life hating the woman with whom I shared my so-called childhood. I have to admit to myself that I am the histrionic sort. But I do just feel that the only way for all of this to end peacefully is for us, like adults, to sit down and accept what went on in the past. As wrong as it was. As wrong and cruel as I was. As wrong as she was for taking my Jeffrey from me. The memorial service had been a great success. Nigel was happy that the event had done justice to his lovely Kira's life. He was unhappy, of course, that he would never see her again. Unhappy, too, that she'd been so unhappy and that, perhaps, he'd contributed to the sorry way in which her life had ended. In any case, live for the moment was his perpetual motto. And Derek didn't make a scene, which was a plus. The man had, in fact, disappeared quite quickly after the church service had ended. He hadn't made any demands about being included in the Dorchester plans. All of this was quite a surprise to Nigel, because he was certain that Derek hadn't attended the service in order to celebrate a life lost. He'd gone to try to make a move on Victoria, but no moves were made. Nigel didn't even see Derek talk to Victoria at all. He didn't see him smile or even wave at the woman. Perhaps, thought Nigel, Derek couldn't bear the sight of her. At least, when he'd hooked up with Kira, she was still very pretty and petite. Or perhaps it was that when Derek saw Dawn again, attached to her mother's arm, he realised that he didn't want the repeat hassle of caring for a disabled stepdaughter. In any case, thought Nigel, good riddance to bad rubbish. He felt a wave of sorrow for all the wealthy single women of the world, vulnerable to the predatory wiles of a certain breed of man. Handsome, spineless, blood-sucking, intending never to do an honest day's work if they could possibly help it. A type of man never fully detached from the comfort and generosity of their own mother's ample bosom. But Nigel had a special skill for striking people out of his mind. He had the focus and ability to compartmentalise life of a sword-wheeling Adonis or an unfaithful CEO. He'd done quite well for himself. He didn't need to prove anything to anyone. And that final sighting of Derek Goshawk in the church was to be the very last time that that imbecile would ever infect Nigel's thoughts. It was Tuesday, and Nigel had decided that he would take Dawn out for tea, just as Kira had always done. It was to be a surprise, and he was happy to see Dawn appear at the front door when he rang the bell, beaming and offering her arms open wide. Uncle Nigel, have you come to see me? I've come to take you out. Where are you taking me? I thought we could go to Kew. Dawn said that she was just going to get changed from her uniform. Within a few minutes, she was bounding down the stairs, and then they hopped into his jag and they set off for Richmond. Very soon, Dawn was chatting about how upset she was that she wouldn't be allowed to move into the Wimbledon house. Nigel had to swallow back his rage that Victoria was to have his house. He empathised with little Dawn and wished he had had the capacity to step in. He could have paid for live-in help, but he'd never be consulted. He didn't realise how much Dawn was desperate to be more independent, and now, since that psychiatrist had got Dawn to sign the forms, It was too impossibly late. Do you know what I think, Uncle Nigel? Asked Dawn, sitting beside him in the passenger seat. I think Mummy's starting to copy Auntie Kira. Nigel, of course, had already noticed this. He was interested in little Dawn's perspective, but he didn't want to muddy the waters, 
confirm any dislike of her mother, or encourage any unnecessary and hurtful speculation about Victoria's wiles and ways. Do you think so? he said breezily. I don't think anyone can copy Auntie Kira. She was an original. Dawn asked what original meant. It means no one can copy you, even if they tried because you're too much of a special person. The conversation ended without any further delving into the past, and a quiet and comfortable silence settled upon the pair. It was only later on, in the gardens, while strolling past a fragrant hedge of lavender, that Victoria's name was mentioned once again. I don't like purple flowers any more, said Dawn. Mummy's got purple plants all over the garden. When I'm at home, she tells me not to touch them because it's enough to kill a dodo. But it's all right because I'm not going home again. Nigel was bemused by this cryptic sentence. He knew that Dawn wasn't one to babble nonsense, and he'd learned many years ago that she wasn't half as stupid as many people thought. This is lavender. It's not poisonous, Dawn. I'm not talking about lavender. I'm talking about deadly nightshade. What was Victoria doing with deadly nightshade in the garden, thought Nigel. Was Dawn imagining things? How did she even know what deadly nightshade was? Nigel took Dawn by the hand. He suggested they went and had tea, that they went for a little mooch around the gift shop. But Dawn's strange and curious quips didn't end, even when she was perusing the shelves of all the trinkets for sale. Indeed, Nigel saw her pointing to a diary and then she said, That's just like Auntie Kira's. Except hers doesn't have any flowers on it, and hers has got a lock, but I cut it. Nigel was about to ask Dawn what she could possibly mean by what she was saying, but he was cut short when a soft hand came to rest on his shoulder. Nigel turned. It was a young lady, attractive, with a camera around her neck and an outstretched notepad and pen. I knew it was you, said the unnamed lady, almost triumphant. Who should I make it out to? asked Nigel, almost floating with a thrill of recognition. Nigel was never one to turn away an autograph. He found it amusing that he was still, after all these years and with all his personal proclivities, considered handsome and eligible by the woman of the land. He laughed to himself as he drew his unnecessarily elaborate signature that he was still, at fifty, the subject of so much female admiration. Nigel was so engrossed by this little encounter that by the time he had lifted his pen with a flourish and handed it back to this young lady fan, he hadn't noticed that Dawn had disappeared. Nigel felt frantic. He looked between all the shelves of vases, the stacks of tea towels, the expensive chocolate bars. He called out Dawn's name, feared that she'd wandered off, or worse, had perhaps been taken but he soon heard little Dawn's voice calling out. I'm here, Uncle Nigel. Please can you come and help me? Nigel found Dawn standing at the till. A small queue of disgruntled individuals were beginning to form behind her. Dawn had taken one of the diaries and was asking the shop girl for a bag, but she didn't have any money to pay for it. I'll take care of this, said Nigel to the shop girl. He took Dawn's hand again and told her that she wasn't allowed to leave his side. That's three pounds, please. Nigel rummaged for change in the pocket of his bottle green corduroy trousers. I'm not a child anymore, Uncle Nigel, said Dawn over the ring of the till. I just wanted one of those because I want to write down all my secret thoughts, just like Auntie Kira. Secret thoughts, wondered Nigel. Deadly nightshade? All of this was rather ridiculous and sinister. He took Dawn to the coffee shop, He bought a cappuccino. Dawn had an ice cream. Nigel tried to avoid thinking about it. Tried to avoid wasting any more of his mental energy on nasty things and nasty people. But he found a question forming on his lips. And he put this question to Dawn. Did you read Auntie Kira's diary? He asked. Dawn nodded. Yep. Nigel thought that that would be the last of his questions. But then he added... Did you happen to read anything about me? Dawn shook her head. Only things about my mummy, she said. Nigel bit his lip. He had a question, but he didn't want to ask it. What kind of things? Things from when they were little. Did you know that Auntie Kira wasn't very nice to mummy when they were little girls? 
Really? Yes. Kira lost some pearls and she said that it was Mummy who had stolen them. Well, I think that's what happened. And she said to Grandma and Grandpa that Mummy had poisoned her rabbits when it was really her who was the one who killed them. Nigel balked. Kira would never have done such a thing, not the Kira he knew. He found himself snapping his biscotti, dunking it into his sweet coffee and telling Dawn just what he thought. No, Uncle Nigel, you haven't read the secrets because then you'd know that Auntie Kira didn't like Mummy because Mummy was very nasty too. All right, Dawn, I see that's enough, said Nigel calmly, allowing the more disciplined part of himself to take control of this uncomfortable conversation. But the thought didn't leave him. Kira did go to see Victoria just before she died. Kira hated Victoria. Victoria, no doubt, and if Dawn's little stories were true, hated Kira. And Deadly Nightshade? It was all out of the pages of some ridiculous potboiler novel. That kind of thing didn't happen in the wealthy suburbs of Belfast. Surely. In any case, said Nigel to himself as he sipped on the last of his cappuccino, there had been an investigation and it was officially announced that Kira had taken her own life on board that sorry cruise ship. It was obvious that she'd deliberately chosen the spot where survival was completely impossible. Kira, it was clear, had been intent on killing herself. But then it dawned on Nigel, as he watched his little niece enjoy the last of her ice cream, that Kira hadn't chosen the trip. That had been Victoria. But Nigel quickly took a firm grip of himself again. He'd already given all of this a huge amount of thought. The official verdict had been given. A deliberation signed and sealed. Kira's death had been caused by suicide. He did allow himself, however, one moment's vague reflection upon the idea that he had only been comfortable with the suicide scenario because it provided him with a channel for all of his guilt guilt that he pushed Kira to suicide. Guilt that hid the true guilt of his life. Guilt that was much more painful. That he was gay. That he'd been brought up by the Presbyterian Church and that he'd never been able to drop all the staunch beliefs about hell and sin that had been branded so fiercely into his flesh. The drawbridge, therefore, was being pulled up inside him and Nigel would never allow himself to dwell on these terrible things again. Gardens. I got this book and an ice cream. I am going to write my secrets in the book because this is what Auntie Kira does. I mean, what Auntie Kira did. Today was school and I had time with Dr. Jones. Last week I was getting very annoyed with her because I think she was being nasty. Also, she made friends with Mummy and someone who makes friends with Mummy doesn't really know her because she is not nice. But today, Dr. Jones was very different, because she told me that I had a dog. That was nice of her. She told me that I had a puppy, and I can call it whatever I like. But if I want to see it, I have to go to Northern Ireland. I think that this is all right that I will go to Northern Ireland, because I love the dog. Now I know why Dr. Jones was asking me before, what are my favourite dogs? I told her Labradors, because they are dogs that are really smiley. I hope I have a Labrador dog, because they are my favourite. I will call it Auntie Kira, because she was always smiling. Dr Jones told me it was Mummy's idea that I have a dog. That is nice. She is usually horrible, but that is nice. I think maybe Mummy is not nice, but also nice at the same time. 
Auntie Kira was nice, but not nice at the same time. I learned that in her secrets book. Yes, I am starting to think that Mummy might have some nice parts to her. I think I have some nice parts in me. If she is my Mummy, then she might be that way too. One other thing that I must put in my secrets book is that I think you have to be a whole part baddie to kill somebody else. Kira thought that Mummy killed her rabbits, but she didn't. I thought Mummy killed Kira, and maybe she didn't. Etta always says I must not call people in my family bad, because if you say they are, then they really are. I am not sure exactly how this works, but I think it's right. I don't want there to be a big fight between Mummy and me, like there were big fights between Mummy and Kira. And she is looking after my dog, so she must be a nice person. All I know is that there's deadly nightshade in the garden. I know that Auntie Kira died, and that Mummy now looks like Auntie Kira, and that Mummy took Auntie Kira's house. I don't know any of the other things, and because of my new little dog, I think I cannot say that my Mummy killed my Auntie Kira. Uncle Nigel doesn't want to talk about these things. I don't know whether that means, yes, he thinks she killed her, or no, she thinks she didn't. I think he thinks no, because otherwise he'd go to the police. Or maybe he would hit Mummy very hard. Mrs. Wade is ringing the bell now. I have to go. Thank you for being my secrets book. Lots of love. Dawn. for children with learning difficulties. Wimbledon, SW19. Friday, the 18th of October, 1985. Dear Victoria, what a difference a week makes. What a brilliant turnaround in just a few days. Having been quite adamant that she didn't want a relationship with you earlier this week, Dawn is now quite keen to build a strong one with you in the near future. It seems that the new puppy played a key role in this transformation. When Dawn learned of her new pet, she became very happy, almost overwhelmed with positive emotion. It was lovely to see. Dawn means so much to me, as I'm sure she means so much to you. It is always very moving to witness a young person so genuinely and deeply contented. Dawn informed me that she thinks you must be a very nice person to buy her a puppy and also to look after it for her when she isn't at home. She is aware that only small pets, gerbils, hamsters, rabbits and the like, are allowed at Lotons. The prospect of owning her own dog, therefore, is extremely exciting. This, and the prospect of turning 18 at the end of the month, are very thrilling for Dawn. She is happy that you think she is grown up and responsible enough to become an owner of a dog. Not only has Dawn agreed to spend her half-term holiday and therefore her birthday with you in Northern Ireland, but also she says that she is very much looking forward to it. It seems that Dawn has reached the point of acceptance in her grief. The memorial service must have given her a firm sense of closure. In this way, I am pleased to report that Dawn has stopped referring to Kira in the present tense, which is always a strong indicator of a child's understanding of a passing. I do hope, Victoria, that you are as happy and proud of Dawn's progress as I am. I will, of course, continue to keep you updated. I send you all my best wishes. Yours sincerely, Dr. Sophia Jones, MD, MA, FRC Psych. Victoria positively leapt with glee as she read Dr. Jones's latest letter. Not only was she happy for herself in light of this new revelation, she was happy for Dawn. She had to admit that there were moments when she feared that she would have to call in the final solution. All was well that ended well. Victoria had the house, Dawn was staying at Lotons, Geoffrey was in the home. 
and she'd soon have enough money after the sale of the Wimbledon property to continue her lavish lifestyle alone, just the way she liked it. Victoria sat down on the sofa. Sutra bounded up and came to rest on her lap, the favourite of her two Siamese cats, those animals that perfectly complemented her own way of being, aloof, selective, elegant. Victoria even deigned to stroke the animal. It was very unlike her, but this was a special day, a day of celebration, a day of indulgence for herself and all those around her. In fact, she thought, she'd spend the rest of the day planning a well-earned trip with her friends. Paris, perhaps, Copenhagen or Stockholm. They could go further afield, Ibiza. Victoria had long since wanted to investigate the purchase of a modest pied-à-terre in the sun. Victoria decided to phone Rachel. Poor Ducky was working until five, but Victoria was desperate to see her. Since Victoria always paid for the holidays, and Rachel always came back in a good mood and all aglow, her husband never minded Rachel's absence. He'd surely cook the boys dinner that night. And so, Rachel and Victoria decided, They'd meet for a bottle of champagne in the old inn at Crawford's Burn at six, and they'd while away the evening in front of an open fire, planning, conspiring about where their luxurious adventures might possibly take them next. Thank you.